Roman husband wrote to his wife, If you are delivered before I come home, if it is a boy, keep it. If a girl, discard it. Aristotle instructed, When couples have children in excess, let abortion be procured. Roman law agreed with Greek philosophy. Disabled infants should be destroyed. Jesus came into this dark culture. He demonstrated compassion for the vulnerable and offered saving hope even to the worst people. He cared for the sick, fed the hungry, and proclaimed good news. Let the little children come to me. 
Early Christians called themselves followers of the way because they imitated Jesus Christ, whose way of living was radically countercultural. They were mocked, lied about, and abused by those around them. Yet they still became known for seeking justice and showing mercy. They even adopted abandoned babies. People of the way know that human worth comes from God, and life begins before birth. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Throughout history, Christ followers spread the gospel in word and deed, helping prisoners, slaves, the hungry, sick, pregnant women, orphans, and disaster victims. There's the 16th century parish priest Vincent de Paul, who organized care for war orphans, ransomed slaves, and supported victims of failed abortions. In Britain, William Wilberforce and Hannah More worked together to end the slave trade. Gladys Aylward shared the good news in China. She adopted orphans, advocated for lepers and prisoners, and helped end the binding of women's feet. Nobel Peace Prize recipient Mother Teresa spoke of abortion destroying peace. She said, "The so-called right to abortion has pitted mothers against their children and women against men. It has portrayed the greatest of gifts, a child, as a competitor." An intrusion and an inconvenience. The same compassion that motivated these believers and millions of others throughout history led Francis Schaeffer to mobilize modern Christ followers to speak up for abortion victims. He helped found CareNet, which supports more than 1,100 pregnancy centers today. These centers empower women and couples with Christ-centered support and realistic alternatives to abortion. Christian adoption agencies help birth parents place their children in loving families. Many believers have even provided shelter for pregnant women needing safe haven. As followers of the way, our convictions remain countercultural. When we help people making pregnancy decisions choose life, we are joining the greatest rescue mission in history, sharing mercy with marginalized people. And seeking justice for the oppressed is still authentic evidence of following Christ. Dear children, love with actions and in truth. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Well, good morning, Main Street Baptist Church. Um, I hope that you are enjoying your snow day. Uh, this is not ideal. This is, of course, weird. I, even though I've done this a lot now because of the whole COVID thing, I still don't like it. I'm still not used to it. I still don't like talking to a camera while my wife's sitting on the couch across the room and making sure I'm not too loud so that my baby doesn't wake up. I still don't like doing that. But that's what I'm doing. So, and I do it because I love you. That's why I do it, by the way, um, and because we want to make the best of the time that we have together. We want to redeem the time for the glory of God. Um, <clears throat> just FYI, uh, quick PSA, public service announcement. In case you didn't know, this is not live. <laughs> If you're just tuning in, or you didn't realize that, because. Um, you know, we were just singing, and now we're not. And how how do we do that so fancifully, right? Um, this is recorded the night before the snow day, uh, January the 15th. The snow is supposed to come tonight, January the 16th, into Sunday, um, and the wintry mix and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, I don't know if we're going to have power or not, which means I should probably do it now instead of trying to do a live stream tomorrow morning. Um, so. And if that way, for those of you that do have power, you can watch it and tune in. Those of you that don't have power, but maybe you have a little bit of battery left on your cell phone and you want to waste it all watching me, go for it. Uh, wherever you are right now, uh, I hope that you are well and I hope that you are enjoying your snow day. I hope that this isn't all for naught. Uh, one of the worst feelings ever is waking up. You know, the next morning you think it's going to be just big um, snow day, and you know the roads are going to be covered. You're just going to be homebound, and then just seeing it's just all cold and wet. You know, and like we cancel church for nothing. Isn't that so sad? Um, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, I hope that you have a real uh, awesome snow day to enjoy. Um, <clears throat> you just watched that video. 
and I showed you that video because January the 16th is uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday, uh, traditionally practiced by most Southern Baptist churches for many, many years now. Uh, most evangelicals really uh, recognize um, Sanctity of Life Sunday, January the 16th. And I think in my time at Main Street, been here six years total, and I have only once preached a Sanctity of Life sermon. Uh, I had already planned to do that for you this Sunday um, until the snow came, so I'm just going to give you kind of a devotional instead online in that in that realm. Uh, what's amazing, though, uh, about that video is seeing how uh, the devaluing of human life, particularly human life in the womb, has been a problem from really the earliest days, from the days of, of Herod killing babies, uh, trying to kill Jesus, ultimately. Um, throughout church history and, and unto de to today, you know, we, we tend to sort of gripe and say this is the worst generation of all the generations, uh, our country's gone to pot and all that stuff. Uh, people have been killing babies for a long, long time and um, Christians should not be okay with that. We also shouldn't be content. Um, we, we want to uh, combat with the Word of God, just showing truth and ultimately showing uh, who God says that we are. You know, Genesis 3, we are made in His image. Uh, he has put His stamp on us, including children unborn in the womb, even to the elderly in nursing homes and those on uh, ventilators and breathing systems and things like that. They are still humans. Um, uh, we don't get to define what humans are. God made us out of the dust and breathed life into us. He gets to define what humans are. We don't get to say when it begins or when it ends, or we would make ourselves God. Um, another reason today is important is because Canada passed a bill this week um, basically uh, criminalizing anybody who would counsel or steer an individual away from homosexual practice. Uh, or homosexual uh, tendencies or desires uh, or transgenderism. So, uh, and, and these, these are you know, pastors in Canada who are now faced with um, decisions. And so a call has been made for pastors to preach on biblical sexuality today as well, um, which is important and difficult. Uh, and, and we want to remember that, um, especially as Christians uh, who are called to love neighbor, uh, to love God, um, we see the image of God in every homosexual, every transgender person, and all those who are confused in the LGBT community, and um, they see uh, a desire um, that has been perverted. Uh, they, they essentially want to make something God uh, rather than who God designed them to be. They're trying to satisfy themselves. They're trying to find some sort of fulfilling thing in their life. And, um, and it's, it's clouded because God's vision, God's stamp, God's uh, imago Dei on them has uh, been distorted. And so we want to call people out of that and into light. It's not that we just hate gay people. You know, if you're, if you're here and uh, maybe you struggle with these things or, or you would even identify as someone, um, I want you to know that uh, we love you. Um, I hope that you stick through this whole thing and listen to God's word. Um, and we want you to, to find who you are truly meant to be in Jesus. Um, there is a, a much richer experience and, and, and more joy and hope than you could ever imagine in seeing who you were designed to be by your maker. Uh, that's what we have found. We haven't done it ourselves. God has given us this you know, great salvation. We, we have done no work to deserve anything. And, and we invite you to come and receive this, this gift by this uh, free gift of, of living water without, without money. It's free. Come and, and receive it. So anyways, those are just a few thoughts. Um, I don't want to go too long because uh, one thing I've learned through all of this is that um, you know a, a full-fledged sermon really just ain't helping nobody when it's online like this. So I want to be as short uh, and precise and clear as possible. We're going to look at Psalm number two this morning, uh, just for a few minutes. We'll make a few observations and try to apply it and um, give God glory. Um, let me give one more reminder though. And that is that um, this isn't church, right? This isn't church. We decided to cancel church, which is hard and it's difficult, um, especially you know in a time where you know churches are being uh, bashed so hard for if they just choose to take a Sunday off uh, for COVID exposures and things like that. Uh, I just want to say, even though you know 
we have a clear conscience about this decision. Um, we're happy to talk to you if you have concerns about that. Um, but ultimately, this, this isn't church. This isn't online church. This isn't Zoom church. Those things don't exist, right? The church is the gathered body together. We are, uh, unfortunately, unable to meet because of safety issues. Um, we're not um, choosing worldly desires or conveniences over the call for us to gather as we are supposed to. Um, so if you want to talk more about that, I'm happy to talk to you about that. But this ain't church. This is a devotional from your pastor online, and I hope you can start your snow day with God's word. Uh, he is a holy God. And so uh, let's pray to him together if you're watching on here, and we'll, we'll dive in to the word. Uh, you are holy, Father. Um, there is none like you, none beside you, uh, and you have sent your only Son uh, that we might know you and be able to call you Father and um, have you as, as our God. Uh, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for dying in our place. Thank you for rising from the dead that we could have hope for 2022 knowing that our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He sees the desires of man and the plans of the nations and he laughs. He holds them in derision. His fury, uh, his wrath is sure. Uh, but for those whom he has called, who he has sealed with the glorious gift of the Holy Spirit, redeemed for eternal life, um, we are yours, and you are our Lord, you are our King, and you reign, and you reign forever. Uh, and we, we rejoice in that uh, when we have <clears throat> these political issues going on in our day, um, and uh, us having to make difficult decisions that will ultimately lead to persecution or hardship in the church. I pray that we would stand fast, and that you'd be glorified at Main Street. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> sip of coffee. I hope you have yours. I also have this lovely fire beside me because uh, I know you guys are used to seeing me sweat profusely when I preach on Sundays. So um, I want to really try to emulate that for you by sitting next to this fire even though I'm already very, very warm. I will be sweating a lot. I'll probably sweat through my blue jeans um, by the end of this thing. And I do that because I love you. Mariana's laughing at me. <clears throat> I'm being too loud. Let's look at Psalm number two. Psalm number two. Uh, <clears throat> Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is God's word. Uh, so this is a really cool psalm, uh, one that I hope that you're familiar with. Uh, there are several different types of psalms. You've got uh, uh, psalms of praise and thanksgiving. Those are two that I'm sure you're very familiar with. You've got psalms of, um, uh, they're called royal psalms or king, kingly psalms. Um, that's what we're dealing with today. You also have uh, Psalms of Lament, which I know you know about, Psalms of Wisdom, which are very proverbial. But this is a royal psalm because we see, uh, and this is not your, you know, <laughs> grandmother's snowy day devotional. I know this is kind of a weird psalm to choose uh, <clears throat> in light of all the things going on in snow day and stuff like that. But uh, I think there's really rich uh, food for us. It's a messianic psalm, kingly psalm pointing us towards Jesus. This is quoted uh, a few times in the New Testament. We'll look at those in a moment. Um, but what we have here is um, a comparison between the uh, nations and their agenda, the plans of the rulers of earth, and the plans of heaven, the plans of the Lord, the plans of the, uh, the God who is on his throne and altogether not on earth. He's on a throne outside of earth. Uh, he rules over heaven and earth. Um, and so we're going to just compare the plans of the nations with the plans of heaven uh, throughout these 12 verses. It begins 
Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves together, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Um, now, what I want you to see first is there, there's not just mere information going on here. This is interrogation. Something's wrong. Something's strange with this picture. Nations are at rage. People are plotting in vain. Something questionable is going on. Who are they plotting against? They are plotting against the Lord and against the Lord's anointed. There is direct rebellion against God and God's people going on here in this psalm. And if we try to understand the context, we don't have a title like some psalms do that give us a clue. Um, so we have to do a little bit of Bible reading and some guesswork. Um, but we know that David wrote many of the psalms, didn't we? Didn't he? Uh, we also find out in um, Acts that uh, Paul um, describes David as the author of this one. Anyway, so who are the nations that he's talking about? Uh, most likely, the, the, it's another word, ethnos, Gentile, people, nations. Um, <clears throat> this is most likely David writing this, who was the anointed one, the king of Israel, the nations, the Gentile nations coming against God's people, Israel. Um, we f find in 2 Samuel 7, uh, Nathan is given a charge to go and tell David a covenant from the Lord, uh, the promise that he's made. He says uh, in 2 Samuel 7, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I'll raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for um, my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity... I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Uh, David was God's anointed one in the Old Testament in covenant Israel. And uh, we see from his offspring is going to come the one whom God's steadfast love would abound with forever. Uh, and this is a messianic psalm. This is pointing to Jesus. And we'll talk about more of that in a moment. But we also see this very passage quoted in Acts chapter uh, 4, in which um, uh, John and Peter were arrested. Um, and they were arrested for preaching and proclaiming Christ, and then they were released because they didn't have good reasons to keep them in jail, right? And so it says in Acts chapter 4, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what had been said to them. They lifted up their voices and they began singing. And then here's what they say. Uh, Through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The king set them or Set, set themselves, kings of earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord his anointed. Uh, he says, truly this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now Lord look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch, your, stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So the reason I want you to see that this psalm is quoted in Acts chapter 4 is because those early apostles were applying it to what was going on there in modern day. Um, their government was seizing them, disrupting things, uh, and they took pleasure in it knowing that it wasn't ultimately uh, the church that they were persecuting, but it was the Lord and his anointed. And so what we learn here is that those governments who impose laws that are opposed to the moral law of God uh, or our belief system, they aren't necessarily doing so in hatred of us, in hatred of you and me, in hatred of you know, Main Street Baptist Church. I think they do so in opposition to God. They are in rebellion to God, like all of us are by our nature from the beginning, uh, because of Adam's sin. Um, we've inherited that. And so um, rulers of the earth go on to continue their rebellion against God. Unfortunately, uh, when we see in Romans 13, they're called to actually be ministers of God. Uh, so that means when babies are murdered as a government function, this denies the image of God, and it therefore denies God's implied authority over all of life and civilization. Uh, those nations, which are many, 
all of them, uh, are against the Lord when they apply immoral and unbiblical laws to citizens. Um, they do so because they are in rebellion against God. And who are the anointed, right? The Lord and his anointed. Uh, well, again, that word was used for David. Um, but in the New Testament, it's translated as Messiah in the Greek, right? So can you guess where this psalm is taking us? Uh, look at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So, uh, God is in the heavens laughing, holding them in derision uh, as they are planning all of these things. God knows about the arrogance and the wicked rulers of our day. In fact, you know, if you go back to Acts chapter 4, we just read, uh, John and Peter rejoiced, saying that even the Lord had predestined what had taken place. The Lord predestines all of these things, which is why he laughs, that he thinks that it's their plans that they are making. There is no president, no ruler, no king, no governor that God did not hand select. He even chose Saul. And we see what Saul did to David. Saul was dethroned uh, by the Lord's hand. So think for a moment um, about God's incredible sovereignty. He is not unaware about anything going on politically or any nation or any ruler or any king. Um, he is more involved than you could possibly imagine, even in the midst of all kinds of injustices being done in our day, and that will continue to go on in 2022. Uh, but the Lord is in the heavens. He's laughing. Uh, why? Because as for him, he says, my king, capital K, is in Zion on my holy hill. Um, God's attitude towards those who are against his will is that uh, not of intimidation, not of uh, you know, being challenged. Um, he's not depressed or dismayed about what's going on on earth. He is, he's laughing in the heavens. And you can imagine the Hebrews singing this, right? This is a psalter. This is to be sung. This is a hymn. Um, you know, what, what joy should we not also take when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake? Um, we, we should laugh through trials sometimes um, and psalms like this one teach us how to do that how to rejoice in times of trouble thank goodness for the fire temperature timer because I am getting very hot and probably going to have to change clothes after this oh my goodness let's move um, faster so <laughs> uh, <clears throat> where are we at the Lord's king is not of earth. The Lord's king is on Zion, on his holy hill, which we know to be a sign of heaven, um, uh, a sign that um, this is a place where God's glory dwells. Um, and his king is altogether different from all the kings of earth. It says the, the, uh, the kings of earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together. But his king is solo. He needs no one to give him counsel. And he's in heaven doing all that he pleases. He's otherworldly. He's not even of earth. His throne is too big to be on earth. He is the king on God's holy hill. Um, and you know what? That king is on our side. Um, he's our king. Sometimes we, we think that we have to sort of fight and defend ourselves uh, as Christians um, for the sakes of righteousness and truth and justice. Um, and we oftentimes, I think, feel like we're just dudes uh, like on the top of a castle with shields while the world is just throwing darts at us and trying to overcome us and we're just trying to keep the church afloat, ultimately. Um, we think of Matthew chapter 16. Uh, the gates of hell will not prevail uh, against the church. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. It's not The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, a better translation of that uh, word against is, is they will actually not withstand, right? Because who's on the offense and who's on the defense? We often think we're on the defense, the world is the offense. Uh, but I think Jesus would flip the other two around. I'm building my church and they're not going to withstand you. Um, so in other words, he's our king fighting on our behalf for his truth, his righteousness. Uh, God has already established a king on earth. Um, he is a king, uh, or I'm sorry, um, a king in Zion. And he rules over all things, including earth. 
Um, and it's through Christ that he will enact justice and he will do so offensively and totally at the peril of those who are against him like those we have in this psalm here. So in other words, we win, right? I don't know what's going to happen in 2022. I don't know what's going to happen in Roe versus Wade and abortion. I don't know what's going to happen with the LBGT stuff, but I know that uh, we're going to win this thing. <laughs> like, Christians win. Um, I don't know what the next decades or centuries uh, will look like for the church, um, but I know that Christ will stay on his throne, and he's calling all nations to submit to him in his lordship and believe on Christ. Uh, and that's what we are doing. Um, his anointed is in charge. Look at verse 7. Um, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. There's a change of speech uh, from verse 6 to verse 7. Um, it, it changes to first person in verse 7. I will tell of the, de the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Uh, and so if this is indeed David uh, writing this, um, as the anointed king, here's what he's quoting the father has said. You are my son, today I have begotten you, right? And uh, of course we know that the father gave his one and only begotten son. Um, that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Uh, and so David is this archetype, um, the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus who would ultimately inherit all the nations. Um, as God's son, David's anointed, he would be a king not only of Israel, but through his offspring, Jesus would be king over the whole earth, would be king over all the nations. This is the Abrahamic covenant fulfilled, right? Out of you, one man will become many nations, as many as the stars, as the heavens, as many as the sands of the seas. All the nations will be your inheritance. Um, and then Jesus fulfills that, cultimate, that uh, covenant ultimately uh, by being the only begotten son of God. Um, and while you know they merely wrote this referring to an earthly king who you know David was after God's own heart, we would find a greater servant, a greater prophet, priest, and king who would fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament and would go to the cross and die and rise from the dead and thereby through that victory earn his inheritance. And and the thing is, Jesus has always existed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have have always owned everything, but through Jesus' victory. His obedience to the Father, His perfect life, death, and resurrection. Uh, it's through these things that He earns the title as King. Rightly so, the name above all names, who died the death that you and I deserve, the death of sinners. Um, and uh, uh, again, it was Acts 13 that um, quote this and, and, and show that this is uh, talking about uh, David and, and pointing us to Christ. Um, so anyways, here, here's a question. When did Jesus inherit all the inheritance of the earth? Um, Mariana, do you have a perspective? Is she sleeping? I'm sorry, she's struggling. She's struggling. She's not sleeping. She's sad. She wants to be in here listen to the devotional. What's it been, like a half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour? I'm so sorry, y'all. I love you. Um, <clears throat> but the more I say it, that doesn't mean it because I'm not finishing. Okay. <clears throat> when did Jesus inherit all the nations? When did that happen? It happened, as I said, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And before he ascended, um, he told his disciples, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Heaven and earth. I love uh, when Jay uh, quotes that. He says, Oh, she's going back to sleep. Awesome. Uh, he says that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Anything left out, heaven and earth, that is everything. Jesus has authority over all things. Psalm 110 says this. The earth has been made his footstool. Uh, he he um, uh, calls all creation to now submit to his lordship. We worship Christ. We follow Christ. We obey Christ. We love Christ. We adore Christ. We worship Christ. Um, 
And Ephesians 1, in fact, uh, says that the Lord, the Father, has given all things over to him as head and ruler and, and the earth um, under his feet. And he's given all things over to him, um, to the church, which is his body. And he's the head of the church now. So we're a part of this, and this is why we get to be co-heirs with Christ. We inherit all the blessings of Christ through salvation. Um, this is like the best thing ever. And, and you know when it says in verse 9 that you, will, you shall break them with a rod of iron? Um, the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, would actually translate that word as rule. Uh, you shall rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, and so this is speaking, again, I believe, after his resurrection, he will rule all of the earth, including those who are wicked, with a rod of iron, and he will enact justice. Um, so our question is, if, if Jesus is ruling, what about the devil, right? And I've talked with some of you guys about this. What about the devil? Um, well, you know, we do have very real principalities and powers, you know, things that aren't flesh and blood that are very real and we have to be concerned about. But the devil has had his head smashed in, right? Um, Jesus' foot, Jesus' heel was bruised. Genesis, go back to the beginning, right? Uh, but the serpent's skull was severely bruised uh, or, or uh, crushed. I mean, his heel was bruised, the serpent's head was crushed. Um, so, in other words, all of the spiritual warfare and the bad stuff that uh, devil and, and, the, and demons are ultimately up to today is um, the wriggling body of a headless snake. Right? Because he is an already defeated foe and soon Jesus will defeat him once and for all. The final one to defeat is death in uh, the day of judgment. And he will be uh, completely uh, thrown, into the cast, thrown into the lake of fire himself and destroyed uh, once and for all. So, who would you side with? The nations of earth or the Lord who is in heaven? Who is a greater king for us to put our trust in? We don't need to put our trust in politicians. We don't need to put our trust in good politicians. We don't need to put our trust in men at all. We put our trust ultimately in God who raises the dead. We just sang that. Who else uh, has the power to raise the dead? Um, and we see at the end of the psalm that ultimately this is what the Lord is calling all men to do now through the Great Commission. Verse 10. Therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. The psalm ends with a warning. Kings, be wise. Rulers, be wise. You know, our uh, local government, state government, federal government, be wise. Be warned. You are going to be held accountable to God. Um, but I would also include you. Uh, brother or sister, be warned, be wise. Have you submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Do you serve the Lord with fear? And do you rejoice with trembling? Right? We serve the Lord with fear because um, we can't beat Him. And the moment we think we can or rebel or serve with uh, uh, wrongful motives, we, we sin against God. Uh, we, we need to serve with fear, knowing that our God is holy. Uh, he is altogether different from us. And we should have a, a, a level of reference, uh, reverence when we approach him. And then we rejoice with trembling. Uh, and, and, and that seems hard to do, right? Um, but I think that's that happy, holy, awe-inspiring, you know, happy crying tears kind of rejoicing uh, that we see the Lord with and worship him with. And it ends with this appeal that instead of uh, perishing, by rebelling against God, as many of the nations have chosen to do, um, that rather they would kiss the Son and be saved. Kiss the Son and take refuge in Him. Uh, and this is just a normal word in the Bible for a kiss, you know, mouth to mouth. <laughs> but uh, I think specifically of uh, Genesis when um, uh, Jacob is dressed as Esau and he goes before his father Isaac to uh, deceitfully receive his father's blessing. And before he gives his blessing, the father Isaac says, Come here, my son, and kiss me. Kiss me. 
and he smelled, of course, the you know the the phony stuff that he put on him to make him smell like his brother. Um, and he smelled him and he blessed him. Um, and of course, that was deceitful. But we approach Jesus in the same manner. Uh, we approach the Lord knowing that his righteousness, his sacrifice, is enough to cover us, clothe us. Uh, if only we will trust in him and be born again and receive the gift of eternal life, um, to kiss the Son and receive all the inheritance of the nations. Uh, I believe that's what he's talking about here. And it's a beautiful alternative um, than perishing uh, in the Lord's anger. Uh, many churches, unfortunately, today don't believe in God's wrath anymore or even talk about God's wrath, certainly don't sing about God's wrath. Uh, but God's wrath is real, and we need to recognize um, that it is quickly kindled as it should be. But there is an alternative for us. We can kiss the Son and live. So, uh, brother or sister, have you kissed the Son today? Um, have you found your refuge in God? Come what may in uh, 2022. We believe Christ is king, he rules, he reigns. I don't know what you're going through right now. I know many people have COVID or many, many people's family have COVID and you're worried about that and I understand that, but Christ is king. And I know you're worried about politics, I know you're worried about mandates, I know you're worried about vaccines, I know you're worried about Roe versus Wade, and you're worried about the LGBT stuff, and you're worried, 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 worried. Listen, my best thing that I can do for you today is tell you God is incredibly huge. He is way bigger than you could possibly imagine. Um, he is working in, in mighty, mighty ways for the good of his church, and, and we will prevail. Uh, the gates of hell will not come against us. He is calling all nations now through the Great Commission to repent and believe in Jesus and kiss the Son. So if you believe in the Lordship of Christ, I charge you to go and call other people to submit their lives to Jesus as Lord. Because having Jesus as Lord is the best blessing that any human can receive. We call people to, yes, like, you know, be justified through faith or by faith through grace uh, or by grace through faith alone, but then also um, to make Jesus Lord. He, we are his body. He is the head. He's Lord, right? And Jesus being Lord is, is part of the good news. We don't want anyone else to be Lord. The kings of the earth let us down time and time again. Um, what a joy it is. And we get to tell other people this good news that Jesus is already Lord. They just hadn't figured it out yet, right? Jesus is ruling and reigning over the whole earth. And so we preach the gospel, uh, calling men to serve with fear and to rejoice with trembling because he is Savior, Redeemer, Friend. He's also Master, Ruler, and King. So, when we ask our local, state, and federal governments to acknowledge life in the womb, we are asking them to, to kiss the Son and to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. When we ask all the nations to recognize God's moral structure of a man and a woman and no other sexes given to one another in holy marriage, we are calling all the nations to submit to Christ and kiss the Son and live. Um, and, and friends, uh, the good news is that you can do that whether your government has done it or not, whether our government has done it or not. Um, he rules, He reigns, we can trust Him. I hope you enjoy your snow day under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, thank you for um, <clears throat> giving your Son that we might kiss him and live. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Um, thank you for the forgiveness of uh, those who've uh, struggled, um, maybe have had abortions in the past or uh, struggled with um, homosexual uh, desires and things like that. Thank you that... Um, you wash our sins white as snow, and we can be who we were meant to be uh, in Christ and find our identity in Him, our union with Him, uh, Him as Lord and, 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 and Him as our refuge to be a greater blessing than anything our flesh could come up with to make us happy. You ultimately are our joy, so we serve you with fear. We, uh, we rejoice, we worship you with trembling, and we give you all the glory. We ask you to come quickly and make all things new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a happy snow day, folks. I love you dearly. See you next week.